Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I hope your child had a wonderful um, step into prep for their second session. I know it was uh, just a pleasure seeing them come in, and I know Mars and Tali um, really enjoy them, and they, those are able to... I think there are still a couple missing from um, that might have had their first session today, or um, I think we may have one or two that may still be to come. But it was just really good that um, we had a great, great morning uh, or lunchtime. Um, I got the pleasure of being on yard duty just on the natural day that I do yard duty today um, at lunchtime. And uh, I don't think there was a, a preschool child who actually sat down at any stage at lunchtime. They were just on the move all over the place. So it was really cool. Older kids looking after them. A few older siblings dropped in to say hello. Um, they were a hive of activity and I don't, I don't think there were any issues. I think there might have been one little fall over here or fall over there and then a bigger brother or a bigger sister picked that child up and, and they're up and going. So it was really good. So um, thank you for preparing your children so well for today. Uh, and, uh, and I think our transition programs are something that we're really proud of what we are able to achieve and do at school here. So this is, um, our, as you can see on the panel now, I do apologise and these sorts of things really annoy me. So the font that I've used here to try to get a bit of information in is probably a, a size too small. So I do apologise for that. If so as we say to the kids when I'm reading them a picture storybook, if all of a sudden you can't see something because I've got my big body in the way or something like that and you need to move, feel free to move forward if you needed to. Um, but a lot of the information we're going to go through tonight um, is on the screen, but we'll talk about things in different ways. Um, we'll ensure some of this information goes out to you uh, for your own sake. Uh, just a couple of little things. So I've been doing... Nick Jones, the principal, is in Western Australia at the moment. So he's over there for the Anglican Schools Commission Principals Conference. So it was um, obviously just couldn't be in two places at once. I mean, one of those places is Western Australia and the other place is here. You just can't actually even do a half a night. Um, myself is head of junior school and we also have Marcel Gerrish and Tali Silver who are our prep teachers. And um, Marcel is also a year level coordinator. So just structurally within the school, uh, we have prepped the two year level coordinators, which is Marcel, as I mentioned, and it's written there. And we also have year three to five is Nell Parks. So we also have two um, teach and learning uh, leaders. So uh, Andrew Thwaites is the teaching and learning leader across our whole junior school in maths and sciences. And Linda Raymond, who teaches in one docker, so Andrew teaches in four ovens. Linda, who teaches in one docker, is our uh, English and humanities uh, coordinator, teaching and learning coordinator. And we also have Louise Trinkner who um, basically does everything that uh, that makes certain we've got enrolments, we've got communications. She just does an amazing job of getting everything set up with Kelly Cancross in the um, development and enrolments office. So we appreciate Louise being here also. And then our IT guru, guru Alex over there, who's hanging around at the end of the day. So it's a long day. Um, so this session is normally just an information session for our parents of the next year's cohort of, of prep students. The, uh, the information that you guys come into and, and as part of the transition program where the, where the children come and meet me in term one, meet the head of junior school, which is very much just rapport building, and then come back again in term four for a bit more of a developmental questionnaire, are something that I've done uh, probably back in the early 90s when I was teaching at, at Wesley College at Glen Waverley and then when I was up in Albury and doing a head of junior school role, we, we instigated it there too. Hence the question, red, you know, what um, red means stop, green means go. Um, a dog says, cat, uh, dog says wolf, wolf, a cat says meow and then I like to eat fish end. Years and years ago I got chips all the time. Now um, Louise has been a part of this this year. We get a variety of different stuff from... I think one of the best has been cream broccoli, which is just amazing to eat fish and cream broccoli. But the point I'm making with that sort of thing is there's um, a lot of different samples that are in my head over many, many years and seeing many, many kids. And the pandemic has impacted in lots of ways, and most of those ways that we don't know, we don't can't actually understand or it's not clear in our minds yet how the pandemic has impacted. But a couple of little things that I've noticed this year um, and this is no reflection on anybody, just simply the disruptions that we've seen across 2020 and 21 have to have an impact somewhere along the line. The disruptions that we, we, we saw in 2021, we saw that when our kids came back this year and we're seeing it right now where they are fatiguing as our teachers 
very quickly, more quickly than they would have done previously in 2019 or, or earlier. You may see that in your own organisations too, and that's simply because, uh, and I use the sort of analogy, if you were a super fit person in 2018 and 2019, and all of a sudden you get interrupted in 2020 and 21, and you have injuries and you can't get the fitness base to you, then all of a sudden, by the time you get your whole body back again ready to go in 2022, you're actually a long way behind and you've got to build up that stamina and build up that endurance. And that's pretty similar to what we're seeing with our, with our children. Um, pleasingly, at Cathedral College, when the children have come back, they've really settled back in super, super well. But we've just noticed a few things that we think um, this session we've decided to add a little bit to do with early childhood development within that session. Now, I'm by no means, you know, a university educated, well, I am university educated, but not, um, I haven't got a master's in early childhood development or anything like that. It's a lot of this is anecdotal stuff and, and that, that we see in talking with Marcel and Tali. So it takes you through, and so there are, I know there are some people sitting in our audience that have not a child at school yet, um, and so this is to help them a little bit in what they can look for for milestones um, and just the development of your child. And if you've got a younger child still to come through, this might, you might gain some information out of this. So I'll try to go through this fairly rapidly. So the school readiness and early childhood development stuff, all right? So um, most of it starts off with the, the early childhood physical, cognitive and social emotional. So the stuff that you see up there on the, on the board, uh, really looking at how your children learn, okay? And the development of this, this, the first dot point, the skills and the milestone children will reach by about five years of old, go through go, age, I go through the crawling, walking, running, speaking, words and simple sentences, listening and playing alone and in company. So I've got a, I've got a few grandchildren and I was watching um, one of my youngest grandchildren walking around with, um, with one of the teddies, okay, and um, I've, only got, I've got four grandsons, and he's walking around with one of the teddies, and he just sat down with one of the teddies, and he just, he's about to start schooling in 18 months, and he just sat down, he put the teddy down as if the child is at a desk, and he started talking to that teddy as if he was teaching that teddy. Other little things, so, so those sorts of play are what children do naturally to develop those skills and where do they get it all from they model it they get it modeled to them by our parents and the people the adults that they spend a lot of information with so little things like talking to a child is really important um, and again talking in um, in a natural natural language children pick up on those sorts of things so you don't have to our prep teachers might change their tone teaching to talking to a a prep child compared to talking to a year 11 or 12, but they don't change their language too much. You change your language, you suit your language and your vocab, but you can still talk in a normal way to a child and have that child respond. Where the differences sometimes occur is where, where we tend to, as adults, talk too much to children and talk sometimes too much to our own adults too, rather than giving messages in short, simple bursts. So some of you guys will run out of concentration with me in the next five, ten, whatever minutes, and then something will happen on the screen and you'll jump back in again. Children do the same thing. Little things that are really important there is playing with parents is really important. Children learn to play, learn life skills by playing. So the more opportunities you get to play with your child, the better. Now, whether that's going for a picnic on a Sunday, whether that's sitting down and doing some Lego with them, whether that's playing a board game, all those sorts of things are gold. They are still the most fun things to do. So if I could say what is the most enjoyable aspect of my life doing the job that I do, it's essentially meeting all the preps and doing this stuff that I do in Term 4. Because it's one-on-one -on -one with kids and I'm doing things with them. It's just so much fun and enjoyable. Looking at books, holding a book the right way, reading it, guessing what that picture is about, guessing what that story might be about. What do you think of that character? Is he being a nice person or not being a nice person? Just talking to them about books. If they want to parrot what they're hearing you say, then that's perfectly fine. Craft, these are a couple of things. Children at the moment are not using scissors anywhere near as well as they once were. That is, a, that is being told to us by three-year-old kinder teachers that that's a, a skill that is, is changed. And the, one of the other skills that I've actually noticed myself is tearing. So the skill of being able to tear. So... To develop fine motor, as Marcel calls it, pincher grip or whatever, to develop fine motor is really important with children. So the opportunity to have them to play and to tear and to scrunch up paper, to go outside and to build their mud pies, 
to play with sticks and break little and make build things and all that sort of stuff is really really important to do okay craft activities are fantastic for kids to do and they learn all these sorts of things by outside and doing by doing things together playing outside is really important and as an adult too it's sometimes it's it's not interrupting so if you've been sitting in the those um, questionnaires that I do with the kids at times you know I'm sitting there watching them try to make a pattern or build a block and I just want to help them get involved but I resist that temptation because it's problem resolution which is really important that's all part of their development a variety of different things that you'll see physical development obviously there's growth and, and weight gains that happen on average and that body shapes can can develop and change in different ways when they're early and then you go through those five or six different developmental minds, milestones from birth to 12 months, the one to two years where children are becoming increasingly physically de independent. Okay, they may walk, they'll walk forwards, they'll toddle, they may walk backwards, they'll sway to music all of a sudden, they'll use an arm to colour, they scribble, they turn handles. All those sorts of things are part of the development that happens through that first one to two years. The two to three years you find they become more coordinated and they increase their acceleration, their speed and their balance accordingly. Three to four years is about riding a tricycle, three-wheel bikes, going down a slide, throwing and catching a ball, putting in, pulling and steering toys, um, building towers, moulding clay, all a variety of those sorts of things. And they start to take on, some of the things they start to do, take on what they see in, in real life, whether they're trying to build a car or make a horse or show something. That's some things that they're modelling. And I think that's the beautiful thing about innocence of children. Their ears and their eyes are listening and watching everything. And it's amazing what they do connect to. And we see it in kids in school right now when they seem to be distracted by something, whether it's a drawing or a pencil in their hand, etc. And all of a sudden, the you know, teacher's about to say, Johnny, are you listening to me? Or Jenny, are you listening to me? And all of a sudden, Johnny or Jenny stick their hand up and answer the question. And yet their eyes are nowhere near what the teacher's doing. But there are times where we will ask the child to look us in the eye so that we, they can, you know, and, and using an action to help that. So those sorts of things are things that develop and, but along the way with children. Copying shapes, writing some letters or numbers, all those sorts of things that happen through that four to five years. And you will have seen this year the massive growth in your child from the start of the year through to right now. And the developmental, and that's going to happen again next year when they get back into school and they start to be told exactly where to start the right letter, where to start the letter number four from, where to start the letter... Um, those sorts of starting points when they're writing and, 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 and drawing and all that, set, that sort of thing. Um, but also if you come up with little games for them, so, you know, like I do that number five, draw the neck, big round tummy, put a hat on top, okay? Those little real rhymes that you can do with children help enormously about them repeating. So one of the things we do in school at the moment is a thing called retrieval, where the teachers, it's I say, you say, we do, we say. So getting the children, having it told to them, getting them to say it with someone and then having it model and then saying it themselves. That's the sort of skill and development that happens throughout the first five years of your life where you're helping them and guiding them. The cognitive development stuff, um, best way I explain this is, if I got you all to stand up here right now, we're all different, different shapes, different sizes. If I got every prep child to stand up here, they'll be different si shapes and different sizes. One of the... One of the We've got um, one of our boys coming in next year who's quite tall and we had a couple of the grade two girls came running up to me and said, Mr Newbold, Mr Newbold, he's the tallest boy I've ever seen in my life, you know, to be starting at that age. Now, we sometimes see that but we forget at times, we can forget that the cognitive development is just as different. I've had children coming in to read, coming into school, being able to read certain words or sentences but it doesn't mean that they're going to become, become nuclear physicists. It just means their development is a level above. I still remember one child who actually their parents found out their child could read when they were in the supermarket and the parents said, oh, where, where the heck is the milk or where's the bread? And the child said, it's in aisle three, mum. How do you know? Well, you get bread, you can get cereal and you get... Now, their mother had done nothing with teaching their child to read and it can't, you can't teach them to read if they're not developmentally ready to read. But their child was able to connect all that sort of thing. Now, he or she, in that case, the girl, went on really well, but other kids started to catch them up, just like they do physically. So the cognitive development is very individual. But a few things that you can do to sort of help that is language is the most important. So children can start school with any sort of, with a vocabulary from 700 to 4,000 words. So if you're starting 
vocabulary with 4,000 words, that's a massive advantage. If you're starting at a vocabulary of 700, that's a massive disadvantage. So the conversations that you have at a dining room table for dinner, the conversations that you, questions you ask children, all those sorts of things and the language you use is really important to help build vocabulary. So that's an important part of their cognitive development. It also strengthens, they also use their senses in many, many different ways to look to learn about that language. They imitate and they imagine play. Okay, my daughter had a little puppy that lived outside in the kennel for ages and ages and ages. I can't think of the name of it now. She can't either because she's 24. And we used to have great conversation about that puppy. There's no puppy living in a kennel. It was just living in a kennel because that's where she wanted a puppy to be. But we had some great conversations. So what's, what's little, little Joey doing today? Oh, Joey's going to go out and round up the cattle. Oh, fantastic. And how's he going to round up the cattle? Well, he's going to run around them and try to get them to come into the cattle yard. Oh, that's really good. How does she know that? Because that's what she's seen us do. So that language is really important. But that's her learning about life. So those experiences can't happen for her if she's sitting just watching telly all the time or playing on her iPad all the time or just playing even a board game all the time. Being able to go outside and wander and look and explore, every sense is used as soon as you walk out that door. Even the sense of taste when they're putting something in their mouth that you think, I don't really want you to do that. Those are the things that are really important in that cognitive development. The third, the, my fifth dot point, if you can see, the make-believe play. Now, you will notice your children over the last couple of years, their make-believe play becomes even more imaginative, but it starts to actually pick up real life even more. Okay? And then the last dot point is something that's really important. <laughs> children are egocentric. It's all about them. Absolutely all about them. But it becomes less about them as they travel through life. And it's just reminding them that the world is bigger than them. But the way you find out the world is bigger than them is by play dates. That's a really good way. By involving, uh, going on holidays and meeting other people and being in safe areas around other people. By exploring life. And when they get to school, they'll find out very quickly that it's not about them. It's about being a part. And so when we talk about the school being about a learning community, it's a place where you go and learn. It's about what you can do as a student to make the life, the classroom, easier for others. And that's trying to give them that global readiness. Remember, the two lovely ladies in front of me who, who teach prep, every child that comes through their, their door at the start of next year, they have got one eye, part of that eye, on 13 years down the track when the child graduates. And that's one of the greatest things about being a primary school teacher. You see the journey and the pathway. And it's a magnificent journey and pathway, even though 13 years down the track, who knows what that's going to look like for us all. I certainly know when I started teaching, in fact, it started in the 2000s, that was not even around. And by 2007, even really, all of a sudden it was, and how they're developing and changing. So we know technology is going to impact, but we know life is just going to look very different. Social emotional stuff is there for you, and it's just worth reminding. Children use their initiative, which is their sense and skills to make things happen. Okay? And the development of a conscience, that inner voice of self observation. Now, what that means is two things. When a child does something at a young age, they'll either be rewarded by it or they'll be disappointed. So if they're trying to ride a bike and they can't, they're either going to be rewarded by staying on the bike or disappointed because they fall off. Now, if they fall off, they might be really embarrassed and it's the worst thing in the world that's happened to them and they never want to get on a bike again. Or they might pick it up and get on with it. But at some stage, they'll be rewarded. But all their, all their actions have rewards and have disappointments. And reward often means success, so they're going to do it again. And disappointment, well, it sometimes can result in a sense of guilt or embarrassment, depending on what the situation is and how the response is. Because they are about themselves. How does it look to someone else? It's why sometimes, in some cases, when a child does have a tumble or a fall, let them see what they do. See if they get up. See if how they respond. So that little, um, the little girl had a fall over today and a couple of kids came across to her. By the time they did get across to her, she'd got herself up off the ground. She was embarrassed and turned away from them, but she had got herself up off the ground. And then they just distracted her and away she went and played. So... Sometimes as, as a parent, it can be heart-wrenching to see your child come off a bike or, or, you know, or, or something happen that you think, oh, okay, well, let's just see what happens. In just three seconds or five seconds of waiting will help that child to negotiate in their head 
that sense of reward or disappointment. And if the disappointment is going to turn into a bit of a tantrum or something like that, which can happen, just let them work through that. Okay, we often want to be rescue them and say a whole lot of words to them, and yet what they're doing at the time is processing because it's an experience that they've got to understand, just like we do and what we probably do in our own work life. We've got to, when something goes wrong, we've got to think, ah, oh, so why has that happened? But we've got the sophisticated knowledge to understand that. So those things are important. That reward and disappointment we sometimes um, forget about. And um, there's a lovely saying, um, if, if you have a feast every day, you never know what a feast is. Or if you have a feast every day, you never have a feast. So you need disappointment to have reward. You need happiness to have sad. So those binary opposites are important, and that's part of growing up for children. It's part of their development. At four to five years, that bottom one there, they show an enhanced ability to reflect on their emotions, and they grow an awareness of controlling and managing them to meet social expectations. Now, the best way I can explain that is <coughs> most times you will never know your child's managing his or her emotions. You just notice that maybe they're not getting upset as much. A child in grade two will cry less often falling over than a child in prep. Why is that? Because they manage their emotions. They've experienced it. There are times where they have, and you know, if you get to year five or year six and puberty kicks in and your hormones are running wild, well, sometimes boys cry for no reasons at all and it upsets them because they do. And sometimes girls get more emotional with other girls because of their situations or their peers. But kids learn to manage their emotions. And as your children grow older and they... You, you give them more, more freedom and more independence to ride their bike, you're going to hope that they do all the right road rules and follow all the right road rules. But unless you're riding a bike right next to them, you're not going to know. So there is that element of, yes, there's risks in what we do in life, but you will learn that they will control and manage their emotions in lots and lots of different ways. And that becomes a very important skill. So we have lots of charts that we run at school here and... and um, and we, we try to encourage our children not to go from, if they're feeling bored or tired, which we call zero or pale blue, then that's, that's okay. That's okay. That can happen sometimes. If your child is in one and we call that being green and happy and everything's calm and the world's going along really well, great place for learning, great place for playing, that's fine. What we won't, don't want them to do is to go straight to five, which is red. And so they've got to learn. Some children have to learn to manage those emotions and others can read other people and learn to manage those emotions. So it's quite complex. There's a, a lot that happens from 0 to 8. That's the biggest learning curve and learning in the, in the brain neurologically than any other eight-year period in your life. So it's just something to sometimes reflect upon. And that's what... Um, and the parenting thing in a, in a very broad sense. Um, and that's, that's where the families are blended families or, or there's two households that they're sharing or anything like that, trying to provide that sense of stability... A role modelling, and, one, and stability is, you know, my wife is the calmest, most measured person in the world, and the person she married can be up and down like a, like a roller coaster, all right, and our children are the same. That sense of stability is something that I personally had to learn enormously, and some would say I still haven't, but learn, um, because it provides such an important thing for children. That ability to be able to remain calm in a situation where things don't look so calm is really important. To role model good behaviour, to role model all those sorts of the, um, you know, language skills, playing games, card games, board, board games where you have to take turns, all that thing is important. Developing um, a manner of social, emotional, cognitive skills by play. I can't stress play even more than I in my life right now. You know, you're, the children starting next year basically have two years of disrupted play. Now, it doesn't mean that they didn't have social, emotional development at that time. And, and we see, you know, particularly the preps this year who have come off two years in particular, whereas the cohort coming next year, mostly all your children, have had their year at kinder or preschool or whatever. But we certainly notice some differences in the play, just taking turns, being patient, understanding personalities. They're things that are really important. So I'm a huge believer in play dates, huge believer in play dates, huge believer in, in just... Make, give them a phone call and saying, let's, let's meet at Merrill Park, we're going to go down and have a bit of a play down there at the park and let them play on play equipment. The old-fashioned old picnics, can't stress that sort of thing even more, allowing it, the children just to explore. And even if they meet, a, you know, go on a holiday and they're you know, staying in a caravan park and you meet the person next to you and they get to learn to be a friend with that person at a caravan park, 
those things are really important about developing that vocabulary but also developing a sense of social awareness. And whether children are in large families or small families, whether they've got um, cousins close by or haven't got cousins close by, trying to create opportunities for children to socialise and have to compromise and have to um, understand other people's emotions and, and speak and, and also explain themselves, um, all those things happen because of play dates. So I really, I really encourage that. Um, and I think probably that's another thing I've sort of, we've sort of noticed. That's probably been less and less over the last couple of years, quite understandably. But now it's that time we even say to families at school here, you know, you go home on the weekend, go and have a, go have some two or three of your friends from your class who maybe you don't play with that often and have a play date with them just to develop those social skills which are really important for all of us. Um, and then little things like the, the, the simple, sen you know, other things you get from parenting is sensible and correct pron pronun pronunciation, as I can't do that word, simple clear instructions, development of courtesy, holding the door for someone, saying thank you, giving them something, what do you say when I give you something, thank you, if you're asking for something, what's the magic word please, all those little things, they seem natural, they seem natural, but because of the disruption of the last 200 bit years, it's not as natural at times for kids anymore. So developing all that is important. Um, Nonverbal communication, I stress it is probably the most important communication that I know in my teaching career I've ever had. To be able to give a thumbs up, a thumbs down, like, like that. A child to be able to you know, um, have a green light on their desk that says I understand what I'm doing. A yellow light that says oh, I'm struggling with this but I'm going to battle through or a little red little traffic light that says, no, I'm in trouble here. Being able to have non-verbal communication, a child comes up to you and because they say, excuse me, doesn't mean that they, they, can, they can talk. You know they're there and you might just say, just wait, and a hand there, and then once you finish a quick conversation, then it's okay to talk. Non-verbal communication, those things are really critical for children because, again, as parents and as, as educators, we sometimes just want to talk all the time to them, and yet... If it's time to wait, it's time to wait. If it's the children, we have children in our school that when they need a break, they'll actually just do that. If they need to go to toilet break, et cetera, and we know that's legitimate, not just, you know, I want a break, then it's that. Little signals like that can make a difference in children being able to communicate. And the nonverbal communication is really important. Again, the more they play, the more that actually happens. And when they're going through the developmental areas, when they're playing imaginary play, that's all about nonverbal communication and communicating with the little toy they're playing with or their friend because they don't have all the words. Um, and the other thing, the other um, element that comes around that are all those other little jobs, helps or help around the house. What do you do to help at home? What jobs do you have at home? How does, your, how, how does that make your family work? A little phrase that, you know, we're all, everything that you do is as a team. So I think those things are important. Gardening, cooking, setting the table, cleaning up after us, uh, uh, oneself. I love the cooking one because that's, again, the gardening and cooking and some of those things have really grown dramatically through the pandemic. There's a positive that's come out of it. It's, it's that. But we have some children in our school um, that missed out a little bit on that. And so their parents have decided to create a cooking book over the course of the year. So every Sunday they cook. And they take pictures and they write a little sentence about it. And all of a sudden, at the end of the year, they've got a cookbook. They're just little fun things to do. But vocabulary is built out of that. Turn taking is built out of that. Failure, especially if they don't get to the oven in time or it's on too hot and it burns, all those things are important. So that all comes with, um, with developing a child. Social emotional development, we talked about with the play dates and receiving and a source of information between peers, very, very important. And it also helps kids to understand various, various personalities and respond to them. So we all know there's people in our lives that can get, that always seem happy, as if they're just, you know, it's not a half cup, no, not a half full cup, it's just overflowing all the time and they're just wonderful. And we've got some that we know really battle, that something goes wrong and it feels like the world's crushed down on them. We've got some children who, who can just walk into a room and they can find a friend really quickly, where others are a bit more shy. So children understanding others is a way of be dealing with empathy. And so talking about that is really important. Sometimes kids just need the first sentence. So if Tali's sitting on her own, what could you say? Oh, hello, my name is Greg. What's your name? That's a start. Conversation starters help children, but sometimes we have to help them with that 
that start, and it helps with their social and emotional development. I'll just finish that last one for you. So they're the main things that, um, that we sort of wanted to talk about. It's just little things that we've sort of noticed, and I just think um, they're important for uh, us as teachers to reflect upon because Mars and Marcel and Tali are going to talk to you about this in a second, and, and a phrase that's often been used is, is prep is about learning how to learn. And, it's, um, and learning how to learn is learn in its broadest possible sense. So as children being socially and emotionally able to adjust and work to school. And, and when we sometimes have conversation with families about whether your child's ready for school, um, in which you know, I think we're probably never backward in coming forward in regard to that, um, that's usually based never, never to do with the cognitive. It's always to do with that social, emotional stuff that children need to develop. And, um, and it helps them when they're going into their school years. So uh, that just gives you um, a bit of a background and, and about the development sort of stuff. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. I'm quite happy to, to answer any questions about that before I hand over to Mars and Tali. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask or clarify or whatever? Cool. All right. So without further ado, because I'm so organised here, we have Marcel and Tali, and they're going to take you through. A lot of this stuff is also in the booklet, so they'll work through that. Thank you. Um, so the first thing we want to talk to you about is communication. Um, obviously, it's really vital, communication between home and school, um, and, you know, teacher, parent, child and the broader school community, we try to really have um, open lines of communication all the time. Uh, there's lots of different ways you can communicate with us. Um, we're happy for you to contact us via email or phone, um, a note in the diary which come home with the children every day, um, or sometimes, you know, parents just stick their head in the drawer and they say, look, can we catch you for five minutes? Just something's come up, and that's, for mm. us, really, really important. Uh, we s do send home a newsletter, um, a prep classroom newsletter every week, usually on a Monday. And we've actually, in the last couple of years, changed over to doing that via email. So um, we'll check with everyone at the beginning of the year, but if that method of communication suits you, it just has important dates, gives you some information about what's happening in the classroom. Um, and uh, we try to keep you abreast of what's happening mm. in the coming weeks so that you're not taken by surprise. Um, and obviously there's the, the Cathedral College newsletter as well, which has broader school information. Um, the biggest thing for Marcel and I is the diary. Uh, we check it every morning, so you jot in there whether your child is travelling home on the bus, whether they're being picked up, maybe they're going to Osh, um, perhaps they're going home with a friend that day because there's an after-school activity. Um, the tooth fairy might have come and you want to tell us that so we can go, ooh, look what happened to you last night. Or, yes. or they anything. lose a tooth at school and we stick it in their diary yes. to say... <laughs> with sticky tape. So, like, ooh, look at this. <laughs> yeah, so the diary for us is gold. It's a really quick way um, of communicating. And if there's something that you need to tell us that you don't want to jot in the diary, as I said, you can phone or email or just jot a note in the diary saying, look, I'd love to have a chat, could you give me a call? Um, and we'll do that when we're free to do so. Mm, I think that's about it for communication. So the next slide we have is reporting, and we are in the midst of writing reports at the moment, and it's great fun. <laughs> so twice a year we have parent-teacher interviews, and they're term one and term three, and that's where you get to come in and sit down with us and we have a chat. We send home a questionnaire. a questionnaire and there's just some questions and you just jot down what you might like want to you want to talk about and then we can use that also in the parent teacher interview with you and then you will get a formal school report in term two and term four and they are emailed yep they come via email um so yeah they're good and also and the diaries you can use them to communicate with us and we're always available you, um, what we've been doing, we stand at the gate in the morning to meet and greet our little people and we find that works so well for them to settle. And it's a lovely way for you to say goodbye, have a great day 
and then sometimes we catch up with parents at the gate too. Um, so that's another way we can chat and that happens at the end of the day too. We bring the kids out, we say find someone who loves you and off they go home. But if you want to have a quick chat to us then too, that's also another great way to talk. Or if something's happened, we might grab you and say, oh, look, just letting you know, you know, such and such had a sore tummy today. Yeah. These are the things we've done to get through, but just, just so letting you know, you know what's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, that's reporting. Super. All righty. So, um, I don't need to read through this information about term dates. Um, in term mm. one, but I guess the most important thing for you to know is that in those first three days of school when children in other grades will actually start school, mm. the preps do not come to school in those first three days for classes with us. What they do is they come individually for an interview with their classroom teacher. And really for us, that's just an opportunity to build some rapport, have some time one-on-one, -on -one, get to know something about your child. We do ask some um, developmental questions. In literacy and numeracy. In, in literacy and numeracy, but they're really basic skills. And um, for us, it's really about getting to know mm. something about the child and them feeling comfortable with us so that when they do come to school on the... Thursday, is it? Thursday, second. Yep, on the Thursday, the 2nd of February, they've already had some time one-on-one -on -one with their classroom teacher. They know which classroom is theirs. They know where their tote tray is. They know where their locker is. So that first day, it's like, ha-ha, in we go. That's yeah. great. So, uh, so those are probably the important dates there. And we will um, let you know your individual time um, mm. in the lead-up. And, of course, if for whatever reason your time doesn't suit, we can always make a different time. And they have the first one, two, three Wednesdays off as rest days and they will need to rest. So I know Greg spoke about play dates. Please do not, not organise play dates <laughs> on those days. They will be so tired. So if they can just sleep, play at home, just rest because it's big. The first yeah. couple of weeks of school are huge for them but also for you but it's developing this new routine. And then they've been so excited the last two days. The first week, they'll be like, yeah, school. And then you might start hearing, oh, I don't like school. I don't want to go to school because they're they realising... This is every day. It's every day. Every day, all day. <laughs> and the novelty's wearing <laughs> off. So just, you'll be fine off you go to school. Yeah, but um, those Wednesdays are really, really important yep. in terms of rest. Yeah. Um, sure. Excellent. How can I, what can I do to prepare my child for school? Greg's spoken about a lot of things that you already do as parents. A few things we like to talk about <laughs> is independence. That's our favourite word. Coming to school, they need lots of independence. Ways you can help develop their school independence the biggest one is carrying their own school bag. I'm sure a lot of them do that for kinder. Yes, the bags look huge. Yes, they look so big when they're carrying these massive bags that have got a diary and a book satchel and, and a, a jumper box. and a lunchbox <laughs> and a drink bottle. And they're really tired at the end of the day, but please let them carry that. And we say, the kids don't carry your handbags or your phones or your wallets. Please let them own that because that's theirs. It's very special. Mm. And we'll encourage them in terms of developing, developing their independence for their morning jobs once they start mm. school. But you can help with that at home with simple things that they're expected to do for themselves, preferably without you needing to remind them. So it can be as simple as, you know, pulling the doona up on the bed or folding their pyjamas or taking their dirty clothes to the wash after <laughs> they've had a bath. Um, and I know, you know, having a 17 and, 20 and a 23-year-old that, you know, that still sometimes don't do these things, um, it can be challenging to develop those independent skills at home. But for Marcel and I, we are not worried about what you prepare your child with academically mm. to come to school. That's, That's why they come to school. To teach them the academic things that they need. It's really um, the independence and the life skills that... Yeah. Um, that they can be practising before they arrive. So when they get home from school, please don't unpack their bag. 
say, oh, what's in your bag? What do you have to get out? And that this is not day one either. Don't think we're going, this has to happen day one. You know, they'll have to get out their lunchbox, pop it up on the bench, get out their diary, give it to you. Start with that, that's great. In the morning, oh, have you got your bag? You know, you can start with those little reminders. First. And that's an important one because we do have some mm. children that arrive to school without their school bags. <laughs> they've got in the car and they've come to school and there's no oh, school where's bag. Where's your bag? Oh, whoops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in terms of um, reading, I know Greg mentioned this as being something super important mm. um, and not only is it really important for your child's development, but it's wonderful time with your children, sitting and reading with them. They might want to read to you if it's a very familiar book, mm. and the reading might be simply reciting what they remember. And that's absolutely fine well, they and just wonderful. Might make up a story about you know, oh, I don't know. Here's the green sheep. Oh, here's the green sheep jumping over the stars. But it might be the green sheep in the rainbow. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. But they're holding the book. Let them turn the pages. Turn, oh, get, when they're turning snappy the pages, fingers. use your snappy, snappy fingers. Can everyone do this? These two fingers are so important for everything. But get them to turn the page from the corner because that's quite tricky to turn a page from the corner, not from in the middle because it's really easy. Go from the corner and then your pages don't rip either. <laughs> so... Um, Nursery rhymes is the other thing. Um, Marcel and I have been astounded the last few years at, um, I guess, the um, how few nursery yeah. rhymes the kids seem to know compared to 10 years ago, let's say. Um, so any kind of rhyming is um, the key to phonemic awareness mm. for children. It's the beginning of it. So... Um, any songs or books or nursery rhymes that you sing or read to them um, are terrific for their development. And playing rhyming games. Play lots of rhyming games. Oh, you know, we're driving down, there's a shop. I wonder if we'll see a cop. I don't know. Like, just start rhyming and then say to them, oh, look, I can see a chair. I wonder if there's a bear. Can you think of another word that rhymes with chair and bear? Potato. Minato. And it doesn't matter if it's nonsense words either, because it's about the rhyme. So in the car, going to swimming lessons, before bed, make rhyming a new thing, because it's really, really important. Um, Greg talked about um, that adults talk too much, and we certainly can be guilty <laughs> of that sometimes. So um, when you're asking your children to do something, one really clear, simple instruction that they can follow um, mm. is really important. Um, to, just to help develop their listening and waiting is the waiting. other really, really important skill that they need at school. Um, we all tend to stop a conversation to listen to our children um, and it's really, really important for them to learn to wait. Um, and Greg was talking about um, non-verbal cues. Uh, a really, really simple one is to just ask your child if they need to interrupt a conversation you're having with another adult is just to put their hand on your arm and wait. Then you know that they're there, they've got something to say, they're not interrupting, and as Greg said, you wind up your conversation quickly and you say, yes, darling, what is it that you want to tell me? That waiting when there's 24 oh. other children in their class um, is tricky. a big <laughs> learning curve when they've never really had to do it. No, it, it can be tricky. Um, there's a few others up there. One, Tali and I really um, encourage you to practice over the Christmas holidays is opening lunch boxes. I know it sounds really easy. Some of those containers are really, really tricky. And again, they have to use these fingers. Um, they get the hang of it. And they, yeah. of course, we help them. We don't go, oh, no, you can't eat That's today. it, you don't get to eat. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but just help them... Um, you know, if you've got lots of containers at home, get them out. Get them to put a lid on. Get them to take a lid off. Because that's a really good fine motor skill activity you can just do at home. But it also is going to help them when they're at school. Also, chip packets. Practice opening a chip packet by themselves. Practice Using opening a muesli bar fingers. by themselves. It's all these fingers again. Opening those um, squeezy, squeezy yogurts. yogurts. Takes so many muscles in your hand to open them. So if you get your scissors out, you're strengthening, strengthening those muscles 
to open a squeezy yogurt. Um, but yeah, packets of anything, yeah, any kind of packet or container mm. that requires them to use that pin slipper, it's super important. Yeah, and even like twisting a drink bottle open, another good one too, and popping up the pop up, yeah, the ones leaves. that pop up. So all those things that you yeah. never think about because your child walks up to you and just pulls something out and you just <laughs> open it and hand it to them and off they go, which we all do. Yeah. Um, for them to practice those skills, uh, it just makes them that little bit more independent when it comes to sitting down and eating their snack or eating their lunch. And zips, they got a zip on their bag, they'll have a zip on the pencil case that they get here at school. Um, the boys have zips on their zips shorts. Zips on their shorts. Oh yes, boys, zips on shorts. Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> and if you do have a son, another activity you could do over the holidays is using a urinal. Where do we stand? Where do we stand? Because we, have we don't need to be <laughs> in six feet away or, or in yes. the urinal. <laughs> we have had to rescue some people out of a urinal, which was fun. <laughs> so that's another activity. And with the girls clo or closing a door so they can go to the toilet in private. Because we know a lot of kinders don't have doors. But at school, we do have doors. So even, you know, the engaged and not engaged little locks on toilet doors, you can practice those. Again, with your snappy fingers. Very important. <laughs> All righty, moving on. Some of you um, already have children at the, at the school, so you know how the school day works. But essentially, our day bit does begin at 8.55 when the warning bell goes. That is the bell that encourages children to go to the toilet, get a drink and line up ready to be invited back into the classroom. Um, then a second bell will go and we come inside for our homeroom, um, which goes for about 10 minutes. We mark our role, talk about what's happening for the day and so on before we get into our lessons for the day. It is great mm. if the kids can be at school between 8.30 and quarter to nine so they do get a bit of playtime before they have to line up. Um, they get to do their morning jobs. So the morning jobs for the preps is take your bag into your locker, take out your diary, take out your book satchel, put your diary in the tub, put your book satchel in your tote tray. And then we have a whiteboard in our room and every morning the children sign in. And it's for them to practice writing their name, but they're standing up so they're engaging all these muscles. But we tell them, oh, so we know you're here, but we know they're here. But so it's just them practicing writing their name. Um, and they love it. They do. They do. Yeah. It's good fun. And they have some jobs to do before the school day finishes, mm. which is at 3.10. And as Marcel mentioned earlier, we do walk the children out to the gate. If they're catching a bus, we have a walking school mm. bus teacher who um, collects all the prep and grade one children and walks them over to the bus area and makes sure that they are in the right place. Um, if they're going to after school care, we have a particular spot that those children go to and the OSH coordinator meets them there. Um, and that's just outside our building, so, you know, they don't have to go too far. Yeah. So... Yeah, and the day finishes, mm. which is good. All right. Your prep will have a year five buddy, and buddies are just a highlight for the little people. They love their year five buddy. We have houses here at school, so you're, we try and buddy your child up with the year five who's in their same house. So when we have whole school house activities, they've got a familiar face and just someone, someone to, to take them where they them. need to go. Um, we do buddy lunches, we do buddy reading, buddy reading and buddy the games. Fives, the year five buddies love it just oh. as much as the preps. Um, I'm quite certain that on the next transition day when the preps are mm. here for the whole day, we will have the year five saying, do we get to meet our buddies mm. today? And they will. So they'll get to meet their little prep buddies. Uh, it's a special relationship that builds and we do things throughout the year and it's just, it's just a beautiful thing, really. Mm. We love it. We also have a small... Um, Year 12 buddy component with our preps. Yes. Where we spend some time with the preps and the year 12s. Uh, firstly, so that the year 12s get an opportunity to remember what it's like to be beginning school, but also so that the preps get to have a relationship with someone in the senior school. 
Um, and that's a really beautiful relationship too. And the Year 12s are always wonderful with the preps. Oh, they love them. So for this year for Book Week, all the junior school dressed up, but we had buddy time with the Year 12s. So all the preps, we took them over to the VCC, VCE Centre and they're all dressed up in their costumes and then the Year 12s are like, oh, why well, didn't amazing. we get to dress up? Yeah. So next year, the Year 12s are going to dress up for Book Week. But they loved it. So they're reading they their did. favourite book to the preps. And it was just lovely. It was such a good time. It was really good fun. All righty. So um, healthy eating, you don't need us to bang on about this. You know about healthy eating. But in terms of when the kids get to eat at school, we find that um, from the start of the day to recess is too long for the children to have to wait. So we give them a um, fruit snack every morning, um, usually between 9.30 and quarter to 10. And that's just a single piece of fruit or a little container of fruit um, just to keep them going and help their brains keep on learning for that um, extra hour and a bit until recess. Obviously, then they have a snack at recess and they eat again at lunchtime. We do have some kids that have to catch buses home that don't leave immediately after school that get a bit hangry if they um, don't get to eat then. So uh, if your child is a bus child, um, they can bring a snack to eat uh, over in the bus area while they're waiting for their bus. What we do ask is remember, they're only at school for six hours. They do not need this huge lunchbox full of food because they're not going to starve. They and don't want to, to sit there it. and eat it. They want to play. They want to go explore this new place called school. So we suggest, and look, we've, we've got kids who are grown up to now and we've been through the lunch boxes, a piece of fruit or some vegetables for fruit snack. You can, if it's a big apple you've got at home, maybe cut it up into pieces because it's easier for them to eat. Maybe just send half if it's a big mm. apple. Um, recess, whatever you want. You know, oh, I don't know, a muffin or a pack of barbecue shapes. Or another piece of fruit, another piece of cheese fruit. and yeah. something that's quick to eat because recess is not that long no. and the kids do want to go and play. And then lunch, something that they will eat. Vegemite sandwiches, as sandwiches are very popular. We like we love seeing the gourmet lunches and go, oh, wish we could have you know that mum making our lunch or that dad. <laughs> they won't eat it. I mean, they will eat it, but it will take them so long to eat that they're missing out on playing. So if your child's favourite lunch is Vegemite and cheese, give it to them. If your child's favourite lunch... every day. Yeah, <laughs> every day. It's okay. <laughs> so, and some of the kids actually will just bring half a sandwich. And I know you think, oh, you know, They'll they're starve. there all day. It's yeah. such a long time. They need more food. But in reality, even though we take the children out early before the play bell mm. goes to eat... Little people do take a long time to eat and they do not want to be sitting there eating their lunch um, when their friends are off playing. No. So, less is more. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, water in their drink bottles. Absolutely. Please, no juices or cordials in their drink bottles. And we have um, sinks in the classroom so they can always refill their drink bottle during the day. And nuts, we're a... Um, we no, encourage no nuts. nuts. We encourage no nuts. Thank you. <laughs> Just because of allergies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> First day of school arrives. Everyone wakes up feeling a bit nervous, a bit excited. Some handy tips to help you with your first day of school. The night before, have everything out. School uniform, bag, lunchbox, drink bottles. Please make sure everything is labelled. And by everything, we mean the lid and the base of the container. <laughs> the um, hat. The, the socks. Like everything. Socks. Jumpers, blazers. They, you can label their dresses, label their shirts. Literally everything. Ev because you, there's 50 of them and they all look the same. And quite often, they think they've put something in their bag, but they've actually put it in <laughs> someone else's bag. So if it has a name on it, it has a really good chance of making its way back to you. So yes, we suggest lay everything out the night before. Um, 
And then, you know, I get up in plenty of time. People will be excited. People will be nervous. There might be tears. There might be no tears. There might be tears from you. We've um, been there. We've been, we've <laughs> been there. <laughs> so come park in the car park, bring them to the gate. First couple of days, you are more than welcome to bring them in, see where their bag locker is, show them there's your bag locker, pack that in. They can do their morning jobs. Walk them out. See you later and go. Put your sunglasses on in case you've got a bit teary. <laughs> you don't want them to see that because that's not going to help them. Mr Newbold, will there be morning tea first day of school? Cheers and tears, we call that. So, the, yeah, the less time that you are there in the playground with them, the easier it will be for them to separate. It so really take yourself is. off to the parents' morning tea. Have your tears there with the other parents. Um, and and your, ch your children will be absolutely fine. And, of course, if they are mm. upset, we will let you know at the first opportunity that we have yeah. that they are absolutely fine, which they always are within five minutes of you leaving. Absolutely. So please don't think, oh, they're crying all day, they're having a terrible day. They're not. They're not at all. And we're there every morning to help them as well, and we can help you too by going, have a good day, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> But no, it's, it's, it's very exciting. And the day will go so quickly and then you'll be back picking them up and they'll be so tired and you'll be like, what did you do? Who did you see? You know, what have you done? And they'll be nothing. like, ah, nothing. they'll give you nothing. <laughs> All righty. Um, we talked about labels. Yes. Very important. We've talked about in independence. Um, the only other additional information mm. on there is birthdays. Um, in regards to birthdays, absolutely... Um, we love them. We do love them. We love to celebrate them. But that doesn't mean that you need to send something in. But if you do wish to send something in, keep it simple and just be aware of the fact that we do have children that do have allergies. So lots of people like to send in birthday treats. Um, Freddo frogs or Chuppa Chups are they absolutely are the perfect. The kids can easily hand them out. Um, and you don't have to bake them, and uh, yeah, and most you know mostly uh, if we have something simple like that, then all of the children can have them, even the ones with allergies. Oh. 